afternoon, everyone. So it's my pleasure here to, to, to talk today. And I would like to thank you, Giovanni and Peter Spin, for giving me this opportunity of presenting this work. So basically, this work is uh, the result of what I've been uh, doing when I was working at IMEC. Uh, and it's a work that is also uh, has been performed in, in close collaboration with the group of Pietro Garbardella in, in uh, ETH uh, Zurich. And so today I will discuss about spin orbit torque MRAM, kind of high level uh, overview of the topic from some fundamental aspects which are governing the physics and uh, mostly uh, technological perspectives. So after introducing uh, briefly the context of MRAM for embedded memories, I will go across this, this uh, fundamental uh, of uh, spin orbit torques, how we do integrate the technology using uh, um, industrial facilities, uh, what are the typical device performances and, and what I see as uh, some perspectives and outlook for this topic. So in terms of uh, physics, uh, oh, not physics, applications, uh, nowadays we foresee that uh, MRAM is well suited for embedded applications. So what is embedded? So here on the left side, what you see is a typical uh, diagram of the memory hierarchy organization, which is made of different layers. Each of these layers is made of memories with different uh, specifications, which are coming from high density for the storage, but relatively low uh, access time to uh, memories which are fabricating on the die, so close to the compute unit, where the requirements here are more the speed uh, rather than the density, speed, endurance, and reliability. And so in this uh, part of the memory, which are the embedded memories, we have different layers which are called the cache level, basically L1, L2, and L3 levels. And then we have operations close to the CPU, which are going extre extremely fast, typically uh, at uh, nanosecond and sub-nanosecond time scales. And in the cache memory, uh, we have the traditional memories and we see also emerging applications where we have the in-memory computing. So basically being able to compute some logic operation within uh, storage memory and the near memory uh, computation, which are basically what we call also edge devices, which are going to perform some uh, dedicated task uh, for, for, for example, uh, in, uh, speech recognition and so on. And then we have also uh, the, uh, the other type of memories like eFlash which are quite important and which are foreseen today as the, the main entrance point of uh, MRAM technology uh, commercially uh, in embedded world. Okay, and so why is MRAM uh, very adapted for embedded? First, it's a non-volatile memory. So here what we see is an hysteresis loop of uh, MRAM uh, device. So MRAM is uh, this uh, typical two terminal device where we have two ferromagnets uh, which are sandwiching uh, uh, an oxide and depending on the relative uh, state between the two magnets, we are going to have a low or high resistance state. And these uh, typical devices, which are called magnetic tone junctions, are uh, what we say CMOS voltage compatible. So that means that they can operate with already existing uh, technology and they are also back end of line compatible, meaning that they can sustain uh, typical 400C uh, thermal budgets for more than half an hour which are also requirements to complete the technology when it's embedded on a, on a CPU. The other features of MRAM is that it's a very fast uh, technology, typically a nanosecond time scale. It's relatively dense and it has a two terminal or three terminal geometry and it's very endurance. So these are all the requirements uh, needed for embedded world. And it's basically uh, nowadays uh, understood as, as the only memory which uh, is capable of uh, uh, tackling embedded uh, applications uh, with respect to other non-volatile memory like uh, phase change, uh, OXRAM or uh, resistive RAMs. Okay, so why uh, also MRAM is interesting and why is it interesting to introduce non-volatile memory? It's because uh, in this uh, type of hierarchy, we have a regular uh, transfer of data between the embedded and the standalone memories. And uh, basically, uh, introducing non-volatile memory uh, will allow to simplify the, the, me the memory hierarchy and to reduce the transfer of data toward the standalone memories. And this is what we call the memory wall, which is uh, costing a lot of energy and uh, latency. So this will result uh, in a significant gain of speed, poor efficiency, and also could uh, help to simplify system uh, architectures. 
So now when we come to the world of MRAM, we know that there are many families of MRAM. Uh, the very first one, which are the field-driven MRAM, but which are, we all, of course, all know that uh, not suitable nowadays for technology because they consume too much of power. Then we have the spin transfer torque, and I think Jonathan in next talk will give you a very nice overview of uh, this topic. And this uh, device is a spin transfer torque MRAM are nowadays the technology which is uh, commercialized by a major foundries like Samsung, TSMC, or Global Foundries. And then we have emerging phenomena like spin orbit torque or voltage control of, an is uh, voltage control of anisotropy which are promising uh, devices for uh, very fast uh, writing times or very low power uh, uh, writing. And then we have also other concepts like the race track memories or skirmions, optical writing and so on. And so today, obviously, I'm going to discuss about spin orbit talks. Okay, so spin orbit torques, uh, it's basically uh, arising from spin orbit materials, which is the capability of material to convert a charge into a source of spin, and this even without uh, being a magnetic material. And to simplify the picture in spin orbit torques, we have basically two contributions. We have one which is arising from the bulk and which is called the spinal effect. Now we can give also uh, different names, but let's say this is the dominant interaction. And the spinal effect is the capability of a material to convert a non-polarized spin current into a spin current. So that means that the electrons which are going to penetrate this material are going to be sorted uh, accordingly with their spin direction. And this will create this spin current perpendicular to the interface, which will then diffuse to the ferromagnet and result in a torque. So this is here the uh, symmetry of the torque. And if you look at this type of symmetry, this is what we call the anti-damping torque. So that can compensate or add to the damping of the magnetization in uh, other words. Then we have a second type of interaction, which is uh, also a current-induced interaction, and which is coming from the interface. So this is a bit more subtle than this, but we can say this is coming from uh, the interface between the heavy metals and, and, the, and the ferromagnet, and this is called the Rajba interaction. So this is an interaction which is manifesting as a field effect, but uh, it, it so uh, it has the same symmetry as the Hirschstedt field, but with much larger amplitude. And this has also an important role in the switching dynamics that I will show a bit later. So it's uh, basically, uh, it can accelerate the switching. So spin orbit torques are made of this field-like and anti-damping torques. And this is usually found in heavy metal materials like uh, platinum, tantalum, tungsten, which are the standard materials for SOTM RAM technology. And there are also some arising uh, materials like topological insulators, which can possess uh, stronger interactions. And the effect can be found positive or negative, depending on the type of material that we are using. Now, if we focus more on uh, out-of-plane magnetized system, so these are the typical uh, uh, curves that we, we can find for this uh, thematics in terms of switching. So this is related to the initial discovery where uh, it was 11 years ago now, we reported uh, with Mihai Miron and Pietro Gambardella the, the possibility to switch an out-of-plane magnet uh, using in-plane currents. And this was uh, giving birth to this uh, spin orbit torque uh, topic. And in terms of uh, experiments, what you can see is that if we are applying a field into the plane, to the device, and then that we are sweeping the current, what we will see is that we can reverse the magnetization uh, in a bipolar way. But now if we reverse this field polarity to the other direction, then what we see is that we are also reversing the magnetization, but with opposite polarity. So that means that here we have a switching which is bipolar, both with the current applied and the in-plane field. So what you notice is that I say that we need an in-plane field. And this in-plane field is actually relatively important for PMA system. Uh, here, if we look more closely to, the, to this type of uh, curves, where we are applying basically no field in this region, what you can see is that the switching is uh, what we say stochastic. So the magnetization can be uh, up or down depending on the pulse, but this is not a reliable switching. And there are some explanations to this. So the initial easy sketch for the explanation of that is that what I was mentioning that we have uh, anti-damping torque, which manifests as a field uh, applying onto the magnetization. And now if this field is combined with an in-plane field, then the magnetization is not stable and prefers to switch. When they are opposed, it is not switching. So this is a very nice picture just to get a first feeling of it. 
In reality, uh, the physics is a bit more complex, but before this, let me just continue a bit on the switching uh, topic. So here is a, a second uh, aspect, which is uh, how does the switching happens? Okay, so I'm actually missing one graph, which is showing what is doing the anti-damping anti torque alone. So what you would see with anti-damping torque is that it will bring the magnetization into the plane in the macro spin system. And then after the pulse relax, the magnetization will relax up or down, and this relaxation will depend on the magnetic field uh, applied into the plane. So this magnetic field with the torque will generate a plus Z or minus Z a component of the magnetization, and this is why we can obtain deterministic switching. Now the problem is that if we are adding uh, the two components of spin orbit torque, so the anti-damping torque, but also the field-like torque, the micro spin simulations are showing us that we have very strong oscillation of the magnetization, which means that somehow we have a kind of precessional switching. Uh, so it means that the switching at the end of the time, the polarity of the switching would strongly depends on the timing rather than the applying just a, a, a long pulse. Now, if we look at the characteristic of the switching versus time, what we can see is that we have two regimes, one which is thermally activated, one which is intrinsic. But if we look more closely into the intrinsic regime, what we can see is that we have a, a linear relationship between the critical switching current and the inverse of time. So basically, no processional switching. Okay, so this description is also important because this is what we typically find in a heavy uh, in a SOT systems, and this is important later to to describe the physics and to build what we call compact models, which are allowing us to model the device for uh, designing uh, an architecture based on SOT MRAM. But what is important here is that the switching is not following a macro spin model. And uh, the reason behind this is that because so far I've been discussing about two main interactions, so the spinal effect and the rush band interaction, which are both based on current induced effect. And we have been neglecting a third interaction, which was de discovered a few years later, and which is called jelonsky skimo moria interaction, so DMI in short. And DMI is nowadays also a topic of investigation, very important because it can lead to different realities of domain worlds. And this is something which has been widely explored for propagating domain worlds against or along uh, current flow and also to generate skirmings. In the case of SOT and switching by SOT, DMI has a very important role because it will uh, basically cant the magnetization at the edge of the sample. And now, if we are applying an external magnetic field, what is going to happen is that one edge is going to be more into the plane and the other edge more out of the plane. And as a result, that means that we have one edge which is weak and relatively easy to reverse by spin orbit torque. And this is actually what is happening. So these are simulation made uh, initially to show the process. And uh, so we have uh, we apply an external field, then we have a canting of the magnetization favored on one edge, a domain wall is created and then propagated through the dot by spin orbit torques. And this was the simulation, and this is uh, what we also observed experimentally here in uh, this very nice paper, which are uh, basically combining uh, time and special resolution of spin orbit torques on a platinum cobalt alumina dot. And where we see that the magnetization is indeed also in real samples, not only in simulation, nucleating at one edge and then propagating through the sample with specific symmetries. So this was the experimental proof. And uh, this is supposed to be a process varied down to 25 nanometers, and which is also important to account when we want to model the device, the device behavior. So now we have all the ingredients which are uh, basically uh, at play in a SOT uh, physics. And this allows us to, to build what we say a SOT MTJ or SOT MRAM. So now we have a three terminal device where we have a spin orbit torque channel on which we are uh, depositing a ferro magnet and uh, a full tunnel junction. And we pattern the tunnel junction. So now we can at the same time perform a writing by spin orbit torque and operate a reading by uh, standard uh, TMR, so tunnel magnetic resistance, which is uh, the effect used to read this type of devices. So that means now we have a decoupled uh, pass between the read and the write uh, operation. Uh, 
And this also resolves some issues that I have not been discussing about uh, what we call read disturb in STT devices, meaning that when we are applying a pulse, the reading pulse can uh, also write the information. Uh, so this is uh, now what I'm going to discuss a bit into the future, so uh, into the following of the presentation. So uh, there are various uh, challenges to address for a PMTJ, so how to manufacture it, how to obtain a feel-free switching uh, for uh, SOTM RAM, what are the material requirements, and how to uh, improve NTJ performances. And last, uh, uh, what are the requirements to, uh, to be uh, to be com uh, competitive with SRAM, which means to be as good in terms of writing and reading performances and more dense. So there are different uh, configurations for NTJ in plane or out of plane. And here I will only focus on the out of plane, which is from uh, industrial perspective, the most uh, adapted, let's say, uh, for scaling. Okay, so first I will go through the fabrication processes. So these fabrication processes were uh, done firstly in IMEC using 300 millimeter technology. So here I show a picture of a 300 millimeter wafer where what you can see are many dyes, so many units which are repeated on the wafer and on which we are fabricating uh, the technology. So the way we do fabricate it is basically we pattern first uh, bottom electrode access to the device and vias. After that, we deposit the MRAM stack and we do an edge of the MTJ. So here comes the first challenge, which is how to edge correctly your device. Because here you have the, the compromise of etching the device without having redeposition on the side walls. And at the same time, without pinching through, uh, through the, the, the SOT uh, channel. So usually to have no redeposition on the side wall, what we do is that we are uh, etching very long time. And here this is obviously not possible. So we have been developing some sp specific stop etch recipes and rework the way of etching. So playing basically with the angle. And at the end of the day, what we can see is that uh, by combining these two approaches, we can end up with very nice and clean side walls. So basically meaning no shots. And with some optimization nowadays, we can reach a yield, which is, more than 90% of the devices which are uh, functional, meaning not sh no short. So after etching the memory uh, elements, which is the MTJ here, we have uh, again an oxide refill. We do again a planarization step. So the planarization is extremely important in industry in order to make sure that we are starting from a flat surface. And after that, we deposit a magnetic uh, 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 SOT hard mask, which is going to help us to define the SOT channel. Okay. After that, we have again oxide refill, metallization, and we have uh, an electrical device uh, that I present actually here. So what you can see are two bottom electrodes and vias, uh, SOT channel, the MTJ, and the top contact that will allow us to read electrically the device. Okay, and the typical devices that we were producing in, in IMEC are 60 nanometer diameter uh, with these dimensions for the SOT track. Okay, so now let's have a look at the device performances. So the first thing to, uh, for the device performances is that you need to select a system. So how do you select your system? So first you need to select your heavy metal. So your heavy metal uh, is uh, the one that you want is the one with the highest spinal angle, obviously. And if you take materials which are standard for a fab, and easy to integrate. If you look at this table, you will see that the tungsten in its beta phase is the most appropriate one. Then you have a second aspect, which is that each of these materials has, a, has a, what we call a spin diffusion length, meaning that because it's a bulk effect, we need a certain amount of thickness before we can benefit from the maximum of efficiency of this material. But what is also important is that if we are going above this thickness, then basically we are losing efficiency again because we are injecting charges which are not contributing to the, to the, to the switching. So somehow you want to select the material and to be roughly at this maximum of, uh, um, of, uh, of uh, efficiency, but not overpass the thickness of the material. Okay. And then there is a third uh, important aspect is that this is the choice of the, ferro, uh, of the heavy metal, but on top of it, you need also to deposit a ferromagnet and you want this ferromagnet to be of good quality, to have large anisotropy, 
Uh, and we know also that the interfaces are uh, extremely important in, in this domain. They can affect the, the spin transmission across interfaces. They can affect the SOT effectiveness. They can affect DMI and so on. And the more we go to a higher thermal budget, the more we risk also to face issues related to, uh, to intermixing. So all of these are ingredients to consider when you want to build a device, meaning that you cannot take necessarily the most a performant material, but you have to make the compromise in between different materials in order to achieve a performant device. And uh, a last point to consider before going for the device fabrication is uh, you, if you really want to have this technology uh, fabricated, you want also what we say a feel free switching solution. So I was mentioning in the introduction that uh, we need for out of plane magnetized system an in plane field. So there are differ uh, different uh, possibilities uh, introduced in the literature to uh, replace this out-of-plane magnetic field by uh, an in-plane field embedded somewhere in the stack. And this is a solution that we propose and that I will be using in the following the pre presentation. But you can also use exchange bias, uh, for example, at the interface, which provides an in-plane field, a magnetic uh, layer also below the free layer. You can use uh, what we say structural asymmetries by shaping uh, your ferromagnet or using uh, gradients of composition, gradients of, uh, of anisotropy and so on. You have hybrid uh, approaches where you can combine different physics and the most promising one here is the spin transfer torque assisting the SOT, uh, SOT reversal, for example. And then you have also novel materials with different uh, crystal symmetries or simply using an in-plane system. So this, you can revise also this table and for, find more information in the reference, which is not here. So SOT roadmap uh, 2021. Okay, in terms of uh, properties of a typical SOT NTJ device uh, is the following. So we uh, basically, the resistance depends on the tunnel barriers that we are using. In our case, it was a 20 uh, micro ohm centimeter square, uh, ohm micrometer square. Typical TMR was about 100%. Uh, percent. And here, what you see is uh, the, the device. So with offset field, uh, coercivity, and the reference layer uh, switching field. So what you can see here is that we are using a relatively thin device. And when we are looking at the stability of uh, our free layer, which is going to be the storage, typically we want a value which is above 50. And when what we see is that when we are going down in thickness, uh, in uh, in diameter, of course, we are losing volume, magnetic volume, and we are losing thermal stability. So this is something which is relatively important also to resolve. And there are some recent uh, results from uh, IMEC, so that you can find here, which are showing that there are novel approaches to build uh, MTJ, which are allowing uh, on one hand to improve significantly the thermal retention and uh, on the other side to still keep a very good uh, switching efficiency. Okay, so now if we look at the typical electrical switching uh, curves, so uh, all of these results that I'm showing now are obtained without assistance of an external field. They are embedding uh, a, a magnet into the stack during the fabrication. So the magnet is basically positioned into the hard mask used to pattern the SOT track. So what we can see here are typical curves where we are plotting the 50% uh, uh, current versus uh, inverse of time. And what we can see is that, of course, if you scale down your SOT track, you are going to reduce the current. And we can project that for typical target for an application, we would have a writing current that would be in the order of 300 microamps. And this is still too large, meaning that we are in need of introducing uh, novel materials, which are more efficient to go basically below 150 microamps. It's also interesting to notice that on the same device, we can perform SOT and STT switching. This is obvious. SOT is relatively uh, favorable in terms of energy because we can go faster. And nowadays, we are typically hitting this 100 uh, picojoule, a uh, femtojoule, 100 femtojoule uh, for the writing. And uh, there are also some uh, more recent results uh, that I will have no time to discuss today, but I think Pietro Gambardella is going to discuss it uh, next week, which are giving us more insight on how the magnetization is reversing uh, during the pulse. And one of the uh, key uh, feature is that actually this, uh, this switching is also uh, kind of uh, stochastic. So there is a, a delay time between the pulse application and the reversal of the magnetization which was not expected initially. 
But what is important is that on the same stack, we can process both of the technologies. They are manufacturable standalone solution for a SOTM RAM platform. And we need to improve write efficiency. One more aspect is that uh, these devices are very reliable, but there is always a need to improve the, uh, the performances. So they are very endurant. Uh, but there is a strong lack of reports on the typical failures that can exist in terms of uh, write error rate and st statistical data. So this uh, we will need to wait uh, a bit in the future. Okay, so uh, just to go uh, quickly towards the end, I've got a bit of delay, I think. So um, things to, to, to do in the future. So the first one that I was mentioning, if we want to compete with SRAM, it's not only performances, but it's also density. And if you say, if you take uh, SOT uh, geometry, it's a two transistor to uh, operate the device, but that means that it is a five terminal device if you account also for the transistor terminals. And at the end of the day, if you make this picture again, a SRAM, you will see that you have uh, roughly the same footprint on a, on a, for, for a cell of uh, SOT MRAM. Uh, so, there are nevertheless some uh, pathways to optimize also the design of the SOT MRAM uh, uh, layout, uh, which uh, we show that in, in the best cases can give uh, up to 40% of uh, area benefit. It's also important to consider that if we are going toward um, advanced nodes, the uh, periphery parasitics are going to have a significant impact on the switching properties and mostly on the writing uh, latency. And that you can find more, more information in this uh, paper. There are also uh, solutions uh, which are uh, here uh, device solutions. So one of them is to combine uh, spin orbit torques and uh, VCMA. So this is what we call VGSOT, which uh, can uh, basically the VCMA can be used to lower the device uh, energy barrier and uh, by, by the same to lower the SOT writing current. So this is a very interesting approach and it has a second benefit. So the first one is that by doing that, we can really already operate uh, at much lower uh, writing current, uh, which are uh, compatible with existing materials nowadays. But you can also go toward this idea of combining multiple pillars on the same SOT track, which was proposed by uh, Hireo Yoda initially, and where you can select your device by VCMA effect. And by doing so, what we are showing with this type of table, so this is called a DTCO, Digital uh, Design to uh, Co-Optimization, Design to Technology Co-Optimization, we can show that by placing four MTJ on the same SO3 track would allow us to gain a significant uh, area and to be competitive with a two-terminal device. So this is a, a promising approach to go for high-density SOTM. And then you have also the possibility to combine uh, SOT and STT together and to, to make this type of NAN-like device, which were proposed by the group of Wei Sheng Zhao here in this paper. Um, in terms of perspective, we see that we have more and more actors uh, in the game. Uh, so IMEC is developing the technology, but we got also some a recent uh, release from Intel, where they combine SOT and STT uh, uh, also on uh, large-scale wafers, or TOKU, which is uh, also producing uh, 300 millimeter wafers with uh, in-plane technology, and, and who has been the first one to uh, co-integrate SOT MRAM with CMOS. And you have also other uh, institutes which are combining, uh, which are developing this technology on 200 millimeters, for uh, instance, E3 in uh, Taiwan. So industry is uh, progressively moving toward SOT. There are more and more semiconductors and uh, actors and startups uh, on, on this uh, topic, but this is still at the uh, research and development phase because we need still to, to gain in maturities in terms of uh, materials and also to improve the performances of the device. A uh, last uh, outlook that I want to give is that we can go beyond typical memory application. And what I was mentioning at the beginning of the talk is that we have this near in-memory computing. And here I give an example of what uh, we have been doing also in IMEC, uh, which is for this DNS, so um, uh, neural network uh, concept, uh, and with a multiple uh, uh, how to say, uh, cumulative uh, reading of an array. So here, this is performed uh, for typically for uh, image or speech recognition. 
And one of the requirements for this type of approach, so this analog in memory computing, is that you need a device which has a very, very high resistance, and typically mega -O. So this cannot be used for uh, for STT or not easily, at least. And we have a recent release from Samsung where they are doing this type of operation. Uh, uh, in the case of SOT, what is extremely interesting is that you can decouple the read and the write path. So basically, you are not limited anymore by the resistance of the device. And here we have been showing that we can typically do this type of architecture and that by combining multi pillars, we can also achieve multi level uh, devices. So this is an example of diversification of the use of SOTM RAM. And then you have also possibilities to tackle logic and interconnect um, topics where you can uh, also use uh, the combination of SOT and STT to create domain walls and make operation logics with SOT, or to go towards these novel topics which are combining magnetoelectric or ferroelectric materials with spin orbit materials. Okay, so to conclude uh, this uh, discussion, I showed you that SOTM RAM is nowadays integrated on large-scale wafers. It is CMOS compatible. We have solutions to fabricate it, uh, with, which are including feel-free uh, solutions. It can go extremely fast with relatively low power. And we believe it is a promising solution to tackle the replacement of SRAM technology in uh, embedded uh, uh, memories. We have obviously many challenges to resolve before going towards the reality of having uh, MRAM in, in, in a product. And uh, what I showed you also is that we have some emerging areas of research, like this matching learning, probabilistic computing, cryo computing, or 2D materials. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention.